So it's an honor uh, to be here and to give this talk. Um, and I'm going to start by um, talking a, very briefly about Open Dialogue at Karaputis Hospital in Torneo, Finland. Uh, open Dialogue, I know, I mean, I, as I was looking through the roster of names, I know that there are um, people attending who are very well versed in Open Dialogue. So this will be a review, but I'm assuming that there are people for whom this is new. So I'm going to start from the beginning. Um, open Dialogue is a network approach to severe psychiatric crises and conditions that was developed at Karaputis Hospital in Torneo, Finland, which is a province in the northwest corner of Finland on the Swedish border. It was first developed and evaluated by a team led by Jaakko Sekula, who was the chief psychologist at the hospital at that time in the early 80s, when this first began to emerge. Birgitta Alakara, who was their uh, community psychiatrist, and Yuka Altonen, who was the supervisor of the original Open Dialogue team. He um, is a very distinguished psychiatrist in Finland. He's a psychoanalyst and a family therapist and a professor at the University of Yvaskala. Open Dialogue has garnered international attention for its outcomes for first break uh, psychosis, with 80% of people working, studying, or looking for a job at the five-year marker. Integrating insights from psychodynamic and psychoanalytic approaches to trauma and psychosis, Open Dialogue is mainly rooted in the family therapy tradition that began with Gregory Bateson and made language and communication central. It has also benefited from the influence of the Russian philosopher Mikhail Bakhtin, particularly his concept of dialogue as a model of the living world. Um, Yaku Sekula was the first to conceptualize therapeutic conversation as dialogic in the sense of Bakhtin. Finland's unique geography has allowed for this idiosyncratic cross-fertilization of ideas, drawing on Russian, Italian, Norwegian, and US sources. And here are some of the major influences, Gregory Bateson um, and his research group in the 50s, Milan systemic therapy, which um, developed and emerged in the 70s, drawing heavily on Bateson and the family ther therapy literature that was coming out of the United States, Bakhtin, who was a philosopher, a philologist, a literary critic, Tom Anderson, who was a community psychiatrist in Norway, who invented, along with his team, including Magnus Hall's reflecting process work, which has been one of the most influential formats in family therapy in the last two decades. And Bertram Carone, who is a um, so psychoanalytically trained um, psychologist from Michigan, who wrote a brilliant book called uh, psychotherapy, the psychotherapy of schizophrenia, the treatment of choice. And the Finnish team read Caron's work and integrated uh, his insights into um, the significance of actual experience in the emergence of so called psychosis. So, here is for those who are new to uh, open dialogue. You can see it was uh, first developed right on that Swedish border where it says Tornio. Uh, Tornio is not uh, the, Tornio is on the margins. The International Center of Finland is Helsinki. And so this is a place that was remote and somewhat insulated from uh, mainstream psychiatry where this young team basically wanted to alter 
the way admissions were handled, handled in order to reduce chronification in this old psychiatric asylum. There were also a societal mandate at the time to deinstitutionalize long-term patients and to try to prevent the chronification of new people coming into the hospital system. So that was the impetus for um, the, the creativity behind open dialogue. How do you, how do you get people who've, been in, who've lived in a hospital, how do you help them move into the community after decades of living in a hospital? And how do you prevent new people from sharing that same destiny? So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to um, talk a little bit about my own history in relation to open dialogue. I'm going to give an overview of the seven principles and the 12 key elements. I'm going to give a brief summary of the research and training initiatives in the United States. And then I'm going to close by returning to the concept of dialogue, um, which can be broadly applied and I think is significant really for any form of psychotherapy, even if we can't repl replicate the whole open dialogue system. So um, my discovery of open dialogue was marked by serendipity. Um, and I think as I tell my story, I think you'll notice also that not only was my discovery of open dialogue serendipitous, but open dialogue itself by creating a context for listening, fosters a more open, collaborative, and serendipitous process that aims to develop a common language. In contrast to mainstream, reductionist models of psychiatry that focus on a top-down, what we call monological discourse, and aim instead for the immediate eradication of symptoms. Wikipedia defines serendipity as the accident of finding something good and useful without specifically searching for it. And I think that's one of the characteristics of open dialogue that is important, that there's an emphasis on what Birgitta Alakara called finding something together. Um, the idea of open dialogue creating a common language is not only a psychotherapeutic idea, it's also a political idea. It was Michel Foucault who said that the absence of a common language or shared language is um, an example of social exclusion. And by that, what he meant was that professionals speak a language that the people that they consult with cannot understand. And that this breach, this broken dialogue, is not only um, psychological, it's also political. So this is one of my favorite quotes uh, by Foucault. And um, I want to share it with you. So he says, as for a common language, there is no such thing any longer. The constitution of madness as mental illness at the end of the 18th century affords evidence of a broken dialogue. The language of psychiatry, which is a monologue of reason about madness, has been established only on the basis of such silence. So the notion is that um, our traditional approaches have not made contact with the voice of madness. We have not established a communicative relationship. And that open dialogue is an attempt to repair this political, psychological, social, lingu and linguistic breach. So uh, my own history is that I stumbled across open dialogue in the late 90s. Um, when I was doing research at Smith College on the effects of managed care on the treatment of children and families. So in the mid-90s, 20 years ago, um, 
I had been working and teaching as a family therapist in the Pioneer Valley, which had been a, a heaven for uh, systemic family therapy. And then suddenly with the arrival of managed care, family therapy training programs began to be shut down. Teams that were working together in local clinics disbanded. And suddenly, uh, the notion of family therapy and social approaches in general began to disappear from the clinical landscape. And this was very confusing to me. I didn't know why this was happening. And I had the good luck of being asked to join a research project led by Anita Lightburn, in which she began to examine what was happening in ordinary clinics and agencies in the treatment of children and families with the ascendancy of managed care. And managed care is basically, these are short-term strategies um, that were created by insurance companies to save costs, mostly. And they created common cause with a biomedical reductionist model that they um, argued was more effective, but also you know, cheaper than paying for ongoing psychotherapy. So the emphasis was on um, a biomedical model. So as part of this uh, project, I interviewed uh, people throughout the Northeast on what was happening, what were, what were the effects of this new restrictive economic context. And what we found is that there was an ascendancy of psychopharmacology and downplaying of relational therapies. There was an erosion, erosion of clinical principles, that procedures started to become more important than clinical principles. There was the birth of the idea that was promoted by the insurance companies that medication is the only real thing you can do. There was increased professional isolation. And there was a shift in language. And this is probably the most deleterious effect. There was, the, in ordinary clinics and agencies, um, you know, in, in, in perhaps in some universities, in some family therapy clinics, this wasn't happening. But mostly throughout the United States, in ordinary settings, there was a loss of language of the living world. There was a loss of history, stories, metaphor narrative dialogue. Instead, there was the emergence of the idea that things can be comprehensively understood in non-living terms as chemical imbalances. So what's really important to say about this is that the way that a reductionistic, um, deterministic model became established in the mainstream was on the basis of insurance practices. So insurance practices routinized the biomedical model in ordinary clinics and agencies. And this had a profound effect on the, um, the climate and culture of ordinary clinics. So we published this study um, in the Smith Studies Social Work Journal and also an article in Family Process and at the same time, when I was doing this study, I came across an early paper on open dialogue. And I was really, really astonished, because in this remote corner of western Lapland, there was a community-based, family-centered psychiatric system that was democratically available to everyone, that was reducing the use of the heavy drugs and of the neuroleptics, that was reducing hospital days, that was reducing recidivism, and, um, and was democratically available to everyone, and was starting to report the best outcomes for first-time psychosis in the Western world. So I came across this article. Actually, this is a later, this is later data. The first data that I came across were two-year outcomes. And this is what they showed. They showed that um, only 
uh, 30% of first time people suffering from this form of extreme state um, took antipsychotic medication. Um, 70 or 80 percent were asymptomatic at five years, and 80 percent were working in school or looking for a job. And as we know, and as is well known in ISPS, these are extraordinary outcomes in the industrial world. So at the same time that I was doing this research and I came across this, 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 um, these outcomes, I also actually serendipitously had a chance to go to Finland and to teach in the department where the main developers of Open Dialogue were on the faculty. So I was um, also, I, this quote sort of captures um, the mood that I was in at the time when I went to Finland, which is, um, this is a quote by Carlos Slisky, who was, um, who I worked with at Berkshire Medical Center for many years. He was a, he's an Argentinian psychiatrist. He was one of the few people who saw in a very, I think, intuitive way, the ways in which um, we were losing our kind of therapeutic orientation in community clinics and agencies, and at the same time was pointing toward international developments that um, were retaining these systemic ideas and practices of the original field of family therapy. So in the midst of all this grim picture, like in one of those doom and gloom science fiction stories in which, to our relief, in some remote, remote crevices of the scorched earth, Patches of flowers begin to bloom again. A variety of systemic practices inspired by the powerful ideas of the field of family therapy are growing here and there, are posing new challenges, pushing new envelopes. So inspired, supported both by Slusky's perception of the value of these systemic practices as well as my own research, I went to Finland in 2001 uh, I went there to uh, actually teach a seminar on anorexia based on a different, uh, a, a different research study in which I um, came to some similar conclusions about self-starvation as a process of communication that paralleled the same insights that the Finnish team were developing in relation to psychosis. And that is that um, what we call so-called so symptoms are really, whether you talk about self-starvation or you talk about hallucinations and delusions, they're really signs from the body of terrible experiences for which there are no words. And the aim of psychotherapeutic dialogue is to begin to slowly find words for these inexpressible or unspeakable dilemmas. And this can take one meeting, it can take five meetings, it can take one month, it can take one year, it can take five years. It takes as long as it takes. Um, but this, the, the aim is the same. The other, of course, a thing to say is that once symptoms become established patterns, they, they be, it becomes harder and harder to deconstruct them. But that's the basic insight. And, and as I began to understand that that's how they were working with psychosis at the University of Yavaskala in this department of psychology where I was teaching, I decided to do, to make my own um, pilgrimage to Karaputis Hospital to learn more about this approach. Uh, which I did in December of 2001. So the University of Yavaskala, I mean, one of the distinguishing features about open dialogue is that it's always been connected with uh, a research faculty. So one of the um, differences between um, what they were doing in Finland and other countries in terms of working with psychosis and family therapy is that in Finland they had this long tradition of studying their own outcomes. 
So the University of Yavaskal is in the middle of Finland. Torneo is in the northwest corner. It's six hours by train, two hours by, by plane. And it is, as I said, a relatively um, remote corner. It's made up of small towns and rural areas. And I went there in December. Of course, this is the dark time. Um, this is a photograph of the river outside of my hotel at 8.30 in the morning. Um, to give you an idea about um, what it was like there when I went. Anyway, I went in December 2001, um, and I want to tell you a little bit about this first visit because it really was a um, transformational experience for me, and it was the starting point of my own journey into open dialogue. So I went there. They, uh, Kauko Harakangas, who was the chief psychologist, picked me up at my um, hotel the morning I was the first morning I was there. We drove out to the hospital. Um, this, the staff was extremely kind and welcoming, and they uh, prepared a PowerPoint presentation in the morning, and then in the afternoon invited me to sit in on a treatment meeting. The treatment meeting is the main therapeutic forum of open dialogue. Within 24 hours of a psychiatric crisis, the open dialogue team brings together the person at the center of concern, any family members who are involved, any professionals who are involved, um, the crisis team, the crisis clinicians, and anyone who might uh, need to be involved quickly. So if it looks like this might be, might require a secure setting, then an inpatient nurse would be part of the uh, first meeting. So <clears throat> when I was there that day, uh, Birgitta Alakara, um, who was the, who it, she's now retired, but she was for many years the head psychiatrist there, received a call from a therapist who was very, very worried about a young woman, um, a 20-year-old woman, who was reporting to the therapist that she was suicidal, life was not worth living, she wanted to die. So Birgitta offered to have a treatment meeting, a network meeting that afternoon. The call came in that morning. And they invited me to um, participate in the meeting. So after lunch, I walked in and there was, to join the meeting, and there was this young woman who was about 20, and she was as white as a ghost. All color had disappeared from her face. She wasn't making eye contact. She looked like a shell of a human being. Her fiancé was there. He was the opposite. He was very uh, alert, very vigilant, very protective of her. There was Brigitte, who was the um, um, psychiatrist. There was the therapist who had made the contact, and there was an inpatient nurse, and there was myself. The fiancé was also a professional in the hospital system. He spoke English very, very fluently, and he began to translate from Finnish to English so that I could understand what was going on in the meeting. Other people translated as well, but he was the main translator. So we started this meeting, and Birgitta started, which is the, uh, you know, this is the, the method that we, uh, it's an anti-method method, but this is how we start every first meeting which is to ask about the history of the idea to have the meeting. And the therapist who made the call was the one who requested the meeting, so she began by explaining that she had been working with this young woman, I'll call her Hana, and that she was very worried about her. Hana had come from a very abusive family in another part of Finland. She'd followed her fiancé here, whom she'd fallen madly in love with, um, she didn't have a job. She didn't know anyone other than this fiancé. She was extremely depressed, and the therapist was worried that she would do something. 
as um, as I was watching Birgitta talk with the therapist, what the first thing that struck me was this very open expression in her face that she was just listening and she wasn't assessing the situation. She wasn't assessing the woman. She wasn't assessing the couple. She wasn't um, trying to fix it. She was just listening in a very generous and complete and deep way. And that created a kind of stillness in the meeting that I remember even to this day. And then she looked at the fiancé and said, what are your thoughts about the presentation of the therapist? And there was a stillness, there was a pause, and then something really extraordinary happened, which is, he said, I get drunk and beat her. And when he said this, this woman who had seemed so absent, like a complete, a complete, you know, whiteout, suddenly came back into the room and appeared alert and present for the first time. And we were all stunned for a few minutes, and then as I began to process what he was saying, I realized that he had thrown her a lifeline. I turned to her and I said to her, what is more dangerous to you, your feelings of life not being worth living or the beatings? And she said, the beatings. So this happened very rapidly, but suddenly, rather than having, you know, an individual, you had an individual with a context and a story that made sense. You know, that she um, had come from a very abusive family. There was no family to go back to. She was isolated. She'd fallen in love with this man. And yet, at the same time, he could be um, very cruel and abusive to her. And she was profoundly isolated. And this process of deep listening opened up a context where new voices could come in, new voices could be heard. So in the course of the meeting, they, um, the man agreed to go into a program for people who are violent toward their partners. The woman was stay, was the, I think the hospital had the woman stay overnight so that they could monitor the situation. But there was a, a new view of the problem that had emerged, which opened up many more possibilities. It would be easy to see if the, if the fiancé had not been there, if the listening had not been what it was, that this woman would have been diagnosed um, you know, with a severe diagnosis, hospitalized, and that would have been the beginning of a psychiatric career. So um, that um, so let me now switch a little bit because that that was the beginning when I had that experience. Um, that was really the beginning of my trying to go more deeply into what this open dialogue approach was all about. And so I'm going to shift a little bit here and speak in a more objective voice and talk about the the elements of open dialogue, how we understand it, um, and how it's been codified by the Finnish team. So open dialogue is both a system and it's a way of doing therapy within that system. So there are two layers of analysis. There are the institutional practices and then there are the language practices or what happens moment by moment in the treatment team. And it is the conviction of open dialogue practitioners that in working with severe crises and conditions, you need both levels, both the institutional practices and the language practices are essential in order to achieve the best outcomes. That said, the language practices, which we also call, which we also call dialogic practice, seems to improve situations regardless of whether or not we have the full system in place. 
So here are some of the key assumptions of open dialogue, which I think are important just to be explicit about. The first is neither the patient nor the family are seen as either the cause of the psychosis or the object of treatment, but are engaged as competent or potentially competent partners in the recovery process. This is very important. It's one of the ways in which open dialogue distinguishes itself from the family therapy tradition because we do not blame families, nor do we blame the person at the center of concern. We assume a kind of ideological agnosticism. We don't know what causes so-called psychosis, um, but we do know that in a practical sense, if you can engage the family in a positive recovery-oriented process, that everyone seems to be helped by that. And I have to tell you that I really, I, I absolutely, um, I always engage families. I've had wonderful experiences working with families. And I really don't believe that the results that I've achieved could be achieved without the involvement on, and the support of the families. I think the families are really an enormous and often unrecognized resource. The other is um, the experience of psychosis is not pathologized. It's understood as a temporary radical, hopefully temporary, although people can get lost in that world, radical and terrifying alienation from shared communication. So we stay, try to stay very close to what the subjective or lived experience of psychosis is. You know, it's not really that relevant to us whether it's a, you know, what the cause is. We don't, we're not that interested in that. What we're interested in is what is the experience of psychosis and how do you respond to the person? You know, it's very uh, usual for, their, for psychosis to be uh, accompanied with a, a paralyzing sense of ineffectiveness, where the person feels like they have no, no voice, no agency, or by which we mean the ability to influence their own destiny. Terror, fear, panic, the emotions of psychosis. So the Open Dialogue team is really uh, uh, trying to address that subjective experience by reducing isolation and creating a, a nurturing, a warm, a calm, a safe, environment. And in my work, I've found that inadvertently, if we come across as too expert or too um, objectifying in our practices, in, if we're, we're operating from a clinical gaze, we frighten people and we inadvertently drive them further into isolation. So the emphasis is to be as much as possible a warm, personal, and professional, but a, a full human being. And the aim at the beginning is to create a connection, not make a diagnosis. So the Finnish team, as I said, they began in the 80s to work this way, and they began to do research. And then at some point, they began to try to distill what are the main principles? These are very well-known principles for anyone who's any contact with open dialogue. Um, and, and these principles are also borne out independently by um, empirical research. So for example, immediate health. You know, there's an enormous literature on the, on the importance of getting there quickly and not allowing people to remain in an extreme state if you can help them to feel safer, more hopeful, uh, and less frightened. Um, so it's very important for there to be an immediate response and not allow people to stay in these terrifying states. The social network perspective is the notion that, um, that there is a, uh, a treatment network that is created that is a um, cobbles together the professionals, the family, the person at the center of concern, anyone who can be of help. This brings extra resources that allows professionals to be more effective. And it reduces isolation. And it also 
reduces induction into the patient role because the person stays connected with um, their, their identity as a son or a daughter or a mother, that it, it, it inhibits their identity from being totalized and colonized by patienthood, which is very important. Flexibility and mobility, this simply means that you're flexible about where you meet with people, that we're mobile, we'll go to people. It also means that there is diagnostic and clinical flexibility. So um, conclusions are um, not made hastily. And there's always a moving with. So in contrast to some so-called evidence-based practice where there's a diagnosis made and then there is a treatment plan that unfolds with some rigidity, this idea here is that we're always learning from the family, we're always making adjustments, we're always moving with, we are adapting um, the treatment to the ongoing needs and understandings that are emerging in the course of treatment. Responsibility means that the professionals take responsibility for the conduct of the treatment. The family is responsible for the change. Psychological continuity means that, as much as possible, the same team stays involved from start to finish, whether the crisis lasts six weeks or six years. And this correlates with an enormous research literature that shows that continuity of providers, continuity of social context, um, continuity of care is associated with optimal outcomes. Tolerance of uncertainty is a very important principle, and what it means is that um, the professionals do not um, make hasty conclusions and judgments or quick treatment plans. That is very important to allow for the time and the process to occur in order to have a legitimate understanding. Um, dialogue takes time. You have to be able to reduce anxiety. Everyone has to have a voice. And it's a process of weaving together a shared understanding rather than imposing an expert formulation. And of course, dialogue is the key. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to return to this concept with more depth at the end of, and at the end of this talk. But dialogue really ta is about, um, this basic condition that every person feels truly heard and is accepted without conditions, and that that is the context for people to come out of these um, situations. That is the condition that can alleviate suffering. So um, when I returned to, Mass to Western Massachusetts, in 2002, I had had, as I said, a transformational experience, and I was very interested in seeing whether any of this could find a place in um, a U.S. context. And I discovered a team at UMass Medical School that I've been working with for now 14 years. It's taking us a very, very long time to have any kind of tangible results. Um, but with the uh, wonderful Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care, who has been, for, who has been funding us now for um, three years, and we just got a two-year renewal of our funding, we've been able to start to um, develop materials that can help uh, assist organizations, but also, individ uh, also psychotherapists in putting dialogic practice and open dialogue um, into practice. Uh, at the same time, in this 15 years, uh, we started the Institute for Dialogic Practice, and we've been training individuals and teams um, through, who have come from all over the United States. Um, I noticed that Rebecca Hatton is on this call, and she um, is one of our outstanding graduates. 
Um, so they're individuals who have done this and have taken this back to their own settings. And Karen Kiefer also, I think, is on this call, who is also one, another outstanding graduate. But in terms of public settings where um, the agencies are really trying to not only create uh, uh, a dialogic practice, but also trying to make the organizational shifts to support open dialogue, there are three main public settings, advocates in Framingham, Massachusetts, um, the Counseling Service of Ad Addison County in Middlebury, Vermont, and Parachute, Parachute in New York. Um, and we've been involved um, in different ways with each of these organizations. We trained the team at Advocates in a two-year training program. I've been going up to um, the Counseling Service of Addison County, and we have um, a graduate of our program who also uh, has been training with other European trainers at the Parachute um, New York um, initiative. So uh, just really briefly, just to comment on why over the last 15 years there's been an opening for, for open dialogue and dialogic practice in the United States. I think it's a product of cultural and historical forces, including the fact that U.S. Dis uh, psychiatric disability rates have skyrocketed um, for children, families, and adults. Um, there's the key testimonies of psychiatric survivors, the psychiatric survivor movement that has brought worldwide attention to dehumanizing and alienating practices in psychiatry, um, and really, um, you know, really, really being the, the, the most important voice in terms of, of saying that, that things needed to change. There's also been um, genetic and research and the research of psychiatric epidemiologists who've challenged the idea that uh, so-called schizophrenia, whatever that is, is a brain disorder, and in fact are showing that there are strong uh, and very profound social uh, factors involved in the, in, in the emergence of extreme states. And finally, uh, the research on psychotropic medications that challenge this notion of insulin to diabetes. There's a, a very important study out of the Netherlands, the, the Wondering study, that shows, in fact, that the best outcomes in using medication um, in a seven-year randomized study uh, had to do with a low-dose discontinuation strategy rather than this standard one-size-fits-all approach to medication. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go more, I could go much more deeply into all this, but I want to um, go back to the notion of dialogue and, and just talk a little bit more about you know, um, open dialogue as, as a system notwithstanding, what significance does this concept of dialogue have for our practice, even if we're not in a system that can um, meet the entire seven principles? Because I, do, I don't think it's a zero-sum game. I think the concept of dialogue will improve one's practice regardless of one's primary theoretical orientation, as long as it's a psychological orientation, you know, that it's not a, a medical orientation. And I just want to kind of highlight that, you know, toward, highlight that in the, in, what, in the time that I have left. So basically, you know, what we're talking about um, in psychiatry is a, sh a basic shift in the rules for thinking that, in fact, biological reductionism is the wrong paradigm. Um, and it's based on the wrong assumption. It's based on the assumption that the brain is a thing. And in fact, um, all of, of neuroscience, all of psychiatric epidemiology, all of genetic research, and clinical practice points to the idea instead that actually the mind is a relational process. 
And that is the or, that is the idea that should be organizing our practice, our work, not the idea that the brain is a thing. And what is truly effective, um, when we can be effective, is responding to a suffering person in a context rather than simply trying to reduce symptoms as part of a biochemical process gone awry. And one of the great thinkers supporting this is the work of Gregory Bateson, who said that the living world is a world of mind, it's a world of relationships and communication, it's a world of circular uh, causality, it's a word, world of mutual influence. And it is the, the non-living world which is cause and effect, um, and where classification um, is simple, and you can predict what will happen. And he's, he was one of the, the, the philosophers who most influenced me in, in suggesting in the 50s that psychiatry was going to go on the wrong track if it recruited a model for the non-living world as a basis for trying to understand human beings living in a living world. I want to just point to this a little bit, but I don't want to go into it too much. Um, right now. So we're basing our practice in psychotherapy and psychiatry on dialogue. And part of the work of the UMass team was to really try to refine what are the elements of dialogue. And there's a paper which I could refer you to um, in which we, we've tried to make these key elements of dialogic practice, practice extremely accessible with lots and lots of examples. And if you're curious, I, um, I can refer that to you. I can type in the reference, and you can have that. Um, hold on. OK. Um, so before we end, though, I want to return to this idea of dialogue, um, which is <clears throat> this idea of creating a language in which a person has a voice. It's the idea of uh, creating a common understanding. And then in terms of treatment, it has to do with transparency, where everything is discussed openly, including hospitalization and use of medication. And I just want to go back to the slide that I just um, went over. If you want to do, um, I'm not going to suggest you do this now, but if you want to do a little bit of research into your own life, about your own experiences of dialogue. Just recall a conversation in which you felt really, truly heard about something that was of life importance to you. And think about what happened in that conversation. And how did you feel that you were able to talk about something that seemed difficult to talk about, and the other person or persons responded by listening and validating you? That really is this, the core idea of what dialogue is all about. And it's actually, it's actually simple. Um, Bach, this is coming from Bakhtin. And Bakhtin says, being heard as such is already a dialogic relation. So the foundation of dialogic practice is to be heard. He also says, dialogical relations permeate everything that has meaning and significance. And like Gregory Bateson, he said, to be, to be human means to communicate. And when we deny a context for communication with people who are severely ill, we are denying their humanity. So I have tried in my teaching to find examples of dialogue, of what this means, what we're really working with, the dialogic nature of life that we're harnessing in healing, in alleviating suffering. And I found this marvelous quote by Helen Keller. And of course, Helen Keller's very famous story of this um, young girl, young child, who lost her hearing and sight when she was 18 months old and 
for nearly six years, um, it, her parents couldn't really make contact with her. And then they found this brilliant teacher, Annie Sullivan, who was able to get through and to create a linguistic and communicative relationship with Helen Keller. I think this is something we all go through, but of course not in such a profound, dramatic way as Helen Keller. But here's what she described. For nearly six years, I had no concepts whatever of nature or mind or death or God. I literally thought with my body. Without a single exception, my memories of that time were tactual. I was impelled like an animal to seek food and warmth. I remember crying, but not the grief that caused the tears. I was unlike an unconscious clod of earth. Then suddenly, I knew not how or where or when. My brain felt the impact of another mind. And I awoke to language, to knowledge of love, to the usual concepts of nature, of good and evil. I was actually lifted from nothingness to human life. Um, Ivana Markova, who's a very well-known philosopher in, Engl in uh, Europe, although no one's heard of her here, said that dialogue is the interdependence of minds, that we are not isolated entities, that we are social and relational creatures. And so what's fascinating about this is she's saying it was contact with another mind that released her potential that that lifted her from nothingness to human life. And I think that's exactly the phenomenon that open dialogue and dialogic practice is har harnessing. It's a phenomenon that is quintessential to our humanity. This is another quote. She knew only darkness and stillness. My life was without past or future. But a little word from the fingers of another fell into my hand that clutched at emptiness, and my heart leaped to the rapture of living. A little word from the fingers of another into her hand. So it's an embodied communication, which is also another very important theme. Um, so I want to give another example uh, that again, is about this, this profound process of life that we call dialogue, that we try to, we try to, um, we try to respect in, in this kind of psychotherapeutic work. And the 12 key elements are the, the sort of benchmarks of what we try to do clinically, but it really is, it's a basic, it's a, it's a basic process. Here's another example of these twin girls that I just love. An embodied dialogue. Twin girls, Brielle and Kiri, were born 12 weeks ahead of their due date. Needing intensive care, they were placed in separate incubators. Kiri began to gain weight and her health stabilized. But Brielle, born only two pounds, had trouble breathing, heart problems, and other complications. She was not expected to live. Their nurse did everything she could to make Brielle's health better, but nothing she did was helping her. With nothing else to do, their nurse went against hospital policy and decided to place both babies in the same incubator. She left the twin girls to sleep, and when she returned, she found a sight she could not believe. She called all the nurses and doctors, and this is what they saw. As Brielle got closer to her sister, Kiri put her small little arm around her as if to hug and support her sister. From that moment on, Brielle's breathing and heart rate stabilized, and her health became normal. This is from Yako Sekola, who's uh, one of the main developers of this. The feelings of love that emerge in us during a network meeting are neither romantic nor erotic. They are our own embodied responses to participation in a shared world of meaning co-created with people who trust each other and ourselves 
to be transparent, comprehensive beings with each other. And I want I just want to go back to the 12 elements so we think about you know this is this profound phenomenon that we're trying to find ways that we can create a dialogic space that this this um, this process of life which is not really it's sort of something that's inherently our um, it's inherently ours but these are the practices that we try to use in order to foster this, to create a space where life can come. So, you know, as I said, this is dialogic practice and open dialogue, but many of these practices can be adapted to more ordinary treatment contexts, including informing individual psychotherapy. I see individuals and families. I don't see couples, but you could also use these ideas with couples. So just to go over these brief, briefly as well as, again, to remind you that there's a much uh, more in-depth written discussion. But the elements are, in working with severe crises, there are two or more therapists um, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that this allows for what we call a reflecting process. Um, it's often difficult in our uh, context to have two or more, more therapists, but it's really the ideal to have, to have two therapists, including the family and network members. Using open-ended inquiry questions, um, there are two questions uh, that begin every intake, every first meeting, the history of the idea to have the meeting, as well as um, asking each person how they want to use the meeting or what would make it a good meeting, launching people on their best intentions. Responding to client utterances is key, particularly the person at the center of concern, uh, which means that rather than leading, one follows as much as possible the utterances of the client and is responsible and is responding and showing at the very least, that they notice that the person, particularly somebody in an extreme state, has made a communication, has tried to communicate. Emphasis on the present moment, what is happening moment by moment now. The importance of multiple perspectives. Everyone in the meeting has a voice, and it's the exchange of all the voices not just the professional's point of view, but everyone's voice that leads to the shared understanding. One responds to the problematic discourse or behavior as meaningful, so rather than pathologizing problems, we contextualize them. The use of a, a relational focus, there's a particular kind of uh, questioning Circular questioning and narrative questioning that comes out of the family therapy field that we use to help to create a relational understanding or an understanding of a person in a context rather than emph emphasizing what's wrong with the person. So how is this meaningful in a context rather than what are the deficiencies of the individual? There's an emphasis on stories rather than symptoms. Symptoms are often a password to stories. Um, and we want to generate stories which can be shared and reduce isolation rather than symptoms which are isolating. The reflecting conversation is this practice that was developed by Tom Anderson and Magnus Hald and their colleagues in Tromsø, Norway. It is the format for transparency where we try to share our ideas with the family and also ask the family to comment on our ideas, making it a more lateral and collaborative process. The principle of transparency, all important decisions that are life-altering, taking medication, hospitalization, are made with the person at the center of concern present. This idea of transparency has become radicalized in, at Karaputis Hospital in um, 
in in Finland, where they they abandoned the clinical case conference. They no longer have conversations about uh, the people who consult them without those people present. And then finally, the notion of tolerating uncertainty, which is about you know giving every person a voice, moving from person to person, not imposing uh, premature conclusions and hasty decisions, and creating the time and safety for actual dialogue to occur. So um, I um, don't know what questions have been asked, but um, we can now open this up. We have 25 minutes for discussion. Um, what do I do um, now, Ron? <laughs> great. Yeah, so we actually don't have, um, you know, any, nobody's typed in questions, but I see people are starting to, to do so. Um, okay. I could ask one question to start out with, and that is, let's say there is just, um, there is just one therapist. Is there any way to include a reflective process, or can you say anything about how people might, um, you know, practice reflection if there's only one therapist? Well, I think there are a couple ways to do it. I mean, sometimes I'll say to a family, you know, a lot of my families know a lot about open dialogue. <laughs> and um, so they know, you know, they, so, so there are two ways to do it. One is I try to bring in, I, I work with, um, you know, I work, I, I have some people that I work with that I try to bring in. If I'm working with a family, I sometimes will just say, do you want to hear my thoughts? And I will reflect. Sometimes I will ask, sometimes I will, I will talk with one family member and ask the families to, to function as reflectors. So anytime you have, you try to create alterations between listening and speaking, where people are moving back between being speakers and being listeners, you're creating a reflecting process. So uh, at the same time, I don't find, I find, and the families that I work with also experience this real value added when we can bring in an actual other person. Um, I work with Naslam Hogman, who's a psychiatrist in New York, and when she can be present and we're reflecting, you know, it really does add a kind of electricity to the process. It moves us faster than with a solo practitioner. But I don't think we should be discouraged in practicing this way or trying to use these ideas just because most of the time we're just going to be solo practitioners. All right. So I see Patricia O'Neill's asking, do you have any specific tips for single practitioners? And she says she's been using some of these principles for before she heard open dialogue, but is wondering about your tips, especially for the single practitioners. Um, okay, so the single, so the solo practitioner. So um, let me pull that together. Let me think about that. So, in terms of the solo practitioner, I think the main thing is to, um, uh, you know, this idea of dropping the clinical gaze, just listening to people. Don't look for the crazy thing in the person or the family. Um, Give the family, and, and what you'll find is if you drop the clinical gaze and you clear your mind and you're, you, concentrate on the, you concentrate on what's happening in the present, the person or the family will tell you what's really going on in a way that is often extraordinary and, and transformational. There's something about our going in with our agenda, our concepts, that's another thing. Start by noticing things. Don't start with your good ideas. You know, I work with a wonderful family where the young man has a limp. You're going to know much more about this young man if you notice he has a limp than if you go in with your ideas about so-called schizophrenia, which aren't going to tell you anything. So right. start by noticing things. It's an embodied process. And allow the family to educate you, to teach you about their own experiences. 
And you will be amazed at how your clinical practice will just come alive. Right. And then the concepts, you know, your training, whether you're psychoanalytic or cognitive behavioral, whatever your training is, family systems, you know, all these are all valuable approaches. Your training will then come to your aid as a response to what you hear. So you'll begin to make sense of it. You can offer your training as a response, and it's so much more effective. Um, and I don't, you know, this approach, this dialogic approach, it's not a model, it's an approach. So it's not really a theory of reality. So you need, you know, whatever your theory is of psychological functioning or whatever, it can accommodate, you know, any, really any, almost any theory that's respectful and contextually oriented. So it doesn't strive for theoretical purity. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, so Rebecca is saying she took the dialogic training and thought that was really very helpful. And then Mary's asking, what was the name of the book mentioned at the beginning by Bertram Karen? Um, is it the psychotherapy of schizophrenia treatment of choice? Yeah, that's the one. Okay. I have a very, I, I have a very, very high opinion of, of Dr. Karen. Right. Yeah, we had an ISPS meeting like this with Bertram Karen that's recorded and available on the ISPS US website if anybody wants to watch it. Um, so Kathy's asking, I like your idea of starting with what you have, including it in your practice, even if the system is not yet in place. What if all you have in practice is a family? And or how can a family find enough local practitioners to explore this approach is maybe what it means. So I, so where's the, should I, let me see. Is the question, is I think it? You can scroll to it. Kathy Laws is asking it. She's basically saying, I think she's is a family member, I think, and is saying, well, what can you take as a family member and, and how okay, can you so, learn from this practice? Okay, so here's what I would take as a family member. I mean, I, um, well, first of all, I'd like to maybe, add, I mean, I have some, I, I have a family that might be willing to talk to, you know, that we, that has worked with us, that might be willing to talk to Kathy. I think that, you know, about how they view these ideas, I think creating a network, I would, you know, I would really, um, you know, the best thing you can do is not let your person, the person in your family who's suffering from become isolated. Also, it's very, very important for people to be around people who believe in the idea of recovery. So um, as difficult as it is to remember that people can and do recover from these experiences. Also, stay away from, I think, stay away from, you know, anything that is too I mean, medication can be helpful, but I think you have to, you also have to have psychotherapy and you have to have, it's very important not to have a medication alone approach, but that there is either family therapy or even, you know, good individual therapy is very important. There are good practitioners in every community um, and who are doing, you know, who have found their own way of working, even if they're not, that's effective, even if they're not calling it open dialogue. Yeah. And, I don't know uh, if that's helpful. But maybe it might be helpful for, you know, if I could ask this particular family whether they would be willing to talk with other family members. Okay. Um, so Patricia O'Neill is asking, what if a client has no others to bring in? Well, um, you know, I have, I'm of two minds about that. Um, I think if a client has no others to bring in, then you work with that person alone. But, you know, it, I would have to know more about the context and... I mean, I think individual therapy can be very helpful. 
usually there is someone and if there's no others if someone is so profoundly isolated then that's what you that's where you begin how do you begin to help that person come out of that isolation also there's the the, the notion of bringing in um, others who aren't present by asking about their voice and their view even if they aren't present oh what would your father say about this if he were here even if the father is deceased you can bring in that and that sort of thing absolutely um, writing unsent letters to dead people and all kinds of things because there's a there's always a network in your mind <coughs> um, and so and Mar Marceline is asking is this process successful for those further into psychosis on strong medications yes it is absolutely um, so yeah you've used it with people at all different stages like you say it might be easier when you you start right away when the problems are first happening before habits and things get ingrained but um, you've used it successfully with other cases yeah and I mean it's it, you know, it, it, um, it can take, you know, it can take, you have to be committed. It can take years, but it's the only thing, this network approach, I think, is the only thing between an institution and being an isolated individual. It's the best thing we have. And, you know, I've seen and am seeing people come back from really, really chronified situations. Um, it's not a panacea, but yeah, absolutely. I I I use this with, and actually, this is where the Finnish team started because they started with trying to quote deinstitutionalize people who'd been completely chronified and were living, you know, on a hospital ward. And the staff also was part of this total institution because they were also living on the ward. Essentially, or you know, in the hospital grounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Christy is asking, what role does medication play in first episode psychosis from the open dialogue perspective? Go slow and go low. <laughs> right. And and you start without you start giving a period of time in which you don't use any medication at all, if possible. Is that correct? Right. If possible, you know, and so and sometimes. Also, you know, sometimes the, uh, often sleep medication will be given. And if you can get someone to sleep, that can really be helpful because if somebody hasn't been sleeping, you know, it can be just terrible. So first thing is sleep medication um, and then, um, you know, 60% of first break in Finland only had mild sedatives and then had this process. But then, you know, in certain instances, they felt that a low, low dose of an antipsychotic was helpful. But all the research is saying, you know, go, go slow, go low, and get people off these medications as soon as possible. They're not permanent medications um, for most people. Sometimes they are, but you know, let's try and see if we can use these medications as thoughtfully and carefully as possible. Okay. Open dialogue isn't anti-medication, um, but it uses it as an adjunct to a dialogical process. Right. So then Ollie's asking, is there any recommendation or for books, for example, for understanding Bakhtin's ideas about dialogue better? Yeah, the best book uh, is a book called um, let's see where is it I'm trying to remember this book um, by a guy at Northwestern University and it's a wonderful book by Morrison M-O-R-S-O-N and I think it's called just called Michael Bakhtin and it's pretty, you know, heavy going, but I think the first chapter um, is really like the best overview of Bakhtin that I've read. I really rely on this, um, as well as reading, you know, if you can, Bakhtin is a wonderful writer, and he's not easy, 
but he's a beautiful writer. And if you can read some of him also in his own words, it's very inspiring. But I think I think Morrison, M O R S O N, is the best writer on Bakhtin. Okay. And then Kara's asking, is there an optimal frequency with which these meetings should occur? How often, and is there a duration or length of time for the meeting that's optimal? Um, the um, it depends on every situation has its own time. It has its own every situation, but often it's. You know, if you're dealing with a a new a young person and you get there immediately, you know, often it's two weeks of very intensive meetings, um, an hour and a half a day for the first two weeks, and then often it's once a week. And it's also it's need adapted, so you can add in other forms of treatment. Um, at the same time, it's really it's a kind of ideal that seems impossible in the U.S., but it's really, you know, as long as the family, you know, needs to be talking in this context. I do some work pro bono, so I can continue to see families as long as needed. Um, so it really is, and the family will tell you but you have to feel your way. There isn't a formula. Okay. And Ken Blatt is saying, since open dialogue is a non-medical approach to creating safe spaces for, for polyphony, I don't know if I'm saying that right, to be yeah, present, have you considered training peers with lived experience in degrees such as LCSW all working in a peer-run organization? Yeah, I think it's fabulous. The more I'm in this field, I, I feel like the peer movement is just absolutely crucial to um, the development of this new paradigm. And um, I, um, you know, I just I just want to engage peers as as deeply and completely as I can in this process. Um, I think it makes all the difference in the world. I think there's there's nothing more powerful than another person who's been you know who's walked this road and and you know come out the other side mm -hmm. in terms of supporting someone else's recovery. So I think that um, you know I, I I can't be positive enough about the role of peers in open dialogue. In in the UK they have something called peer supported open dialogue. And and it, they're doing a beautiful job and yeah. Okay. I just think yes. So Bill in Cincinnati says he's a psychologist since the seventies, a sort of Neil Sullivanian. Worked with people undergoing breakdown, including work in five inpatient settings, often with little support for a milieu psychosocial approach. A recent bad experience with the young family member undergoing breakdown who got caught up briefly in the emergency room and inpatient system motivated him to help start a holistic mental health network in Cincinnati. So Bill works in an outpatient center now and wants to begin taking referral of first breakdown clients, but so far has no fellow therapist or MD as allies. We don't know either whether he's going to get open dialogue training. So what next step might you recommend? Let's see. Okay. It, it's Bill is writing through Deborah Jordan's entry yeah. if you're looking for it in the chat. Well, uh, that is really hard. I would I would re recommend that um, I would recommend you get the open dialogue training. I think. Um, I think it gives you a lot of, uh, it's just going to give you so much more to work with if you're trying to do this. I do think you need to have at least one other person in, this, in your system who could be an ally, particularly uh, you're a psychologist. If there's any, either uh, any prescriber, a nurse prescriber, or an MD who could be an ally, I think it's very, very difficult. 
I think it's wonderful that you're starting this holistic mental health network in Cincinnati. Maybe the thing to do is to visit, maybe to visit some of the places that have put this into practice, like Parachute New York or Advocates, or you can come and visit us just to get an idea, but I think Advocates might be a really good place to visit, or Parachute New York. These are public settings that have started to put these ideas in practice, so you get a sense of what's involved. Yeah. And I see Kathy's asking about what the families can do themselves. I wonder if you could say something just about how when families are just trying to create better dialogue themselves, because families are always trying to talk, right? But how can families maybe use some of these principles to try to make their conversations go better. Okay, so uh, I think the main thing is to listen and to um, and just to try to understand to um, you know and to and to maintain hope. You know, I think that your child is very sensitive to whether or not you feel hope for them. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm just thinking about the families that I work with and what they what they do. I mean um, you know there's a family that I see with you know um, and the parents really they, they've established a routine. They um, They listen, they repeat words, they try to understand. They're very respectful of the process. You know, I'd have to also know more, more about the actual situation. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so Kathy, if you email me at fourronunger at gmail.com, then I can forward your email to, to Mary, and then she, maybe if that other family wants to contact, can get back to you, because I see that you're interested in networking with other families, if you can. Um, Mary's saying, I'm a peer specialist, person with lived experience, and my first diagnosis was anorexia nervosa, then had a manic episode years later. So she finds your insight about the commonality between self-starvation and psychosis to be incredibly insightful. <laughs> There's a comment. <laughs> um, and Fish O'Neill says, practitioners who work this way are very hard to find. Um, my practice is full, and I find it difficult to find others who work this way. One thing I found that helpful is just to set up um, some kind of meeting in your area of practitioners who are interested in this kind of thing. And like, for example, one way is just to have video showings and then talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I do in, in Eugene. You know, I'll just, oh, let's watch Ray Waddingham talking about, you know, um, something and then we'll talk about it and, and invite people in and, you know, you have just once a month, but you end up networking more with other people that have the same interest, and also it builds community support for it. The other thing that we're trying, because these, you know, we were doing these two-year trainings or one-year training and two-year training, and a lot of people can't do that. So, and there's a there's a great interest and demand. So we're we decided to to experiment with doing just a five-day intensive training, just to help people jumpstart something in their communities and see how this goes. So and so in New York, we're going to be doing at the end of May a five-day training a ver to try to see if we can help people get started who otherwise can't do these long trainings because it's, you know, traveling to Massachusetts and it's expensive and it's, you know, it's a year and we want to see what we can do in five days. Okay, so um, Molly's asking, isn't open di dialogue very similar to restorative practices slash circles? What do you think? I do think, I don't know, I mean, I have a student who's into restorative justice, and I really trust his assessment. He says it's very um, similar, <laughs> and I think I take his word for it. I don't know that much about it, but... 
I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Rebecca says, don't give up trying to find allies. It took her several years. <laughs> um, well, Rebecca is a great person to talk to about what she's done. She's intrepid. <laughs> um, Kevin says, asks Mary, can you say something about what you mean by an approach, not a method? Yeah, so an approach is, so a, a method is to, is it con conveys something that, or a model, but a method is more instrumental and technique-y, like I have this method and I'm going to use it to get results. An approach is, is, is a much looser kind of, I have some assumptions about how to approach you, but I'm not trying to do something to you. I'm just trying to make a connection with you. <coughs> and a model has a whole theory of reality behind it. You know, this is a model is, this is a definition of what psychosis is, therefore I'm going to do X in order to um, alter this reality. So we don't operate either with a theory of reality or with a specific technique that's designed to produce a specific outcome. And actually those techniques or having a method can be really alienating to somebody in an extreme state because they feel like you're not interacting them in, interacting with them as a caring human being. You're just trying to get rid of their symptoms through your technique. And it can be destructive. And you get so, you know, enamored of your technique that you lose this. I mean, not always. And of course, once you have a connection, you can bring in all your techniques and your expertise because you have that basic relationship there and then you can bring in your ideas but your starting point is not I'm going to do this to you to make this happen yeah great um, and then Rick's asking can you comment on place of persistence and perseverance against odds so to speak Well, I mean, I think we all have to do that. I mean, I think we all have to just not give up ever on anybody, including ourselves. <laughs> yeah, good point. Rebecca's saying, psychoanalysts were a good support network. Does recovery training, public information meetings, website information, open dialogue study group. Um, and when people get better in therapy, that seems to affect the psychist. <laughs> Um, Karen, great allies are people who want to improve outcomes. They respond to the research outcomes and approach. Rebecca peers are essential. Karen says it's not just a traditional team model where a bunch of players are thrown together around the table, as we see often in different parts of the mental health system. Highly recommends getting training and dialogic approach so that you can do a truly different approach. And Ken says. Advocacy Unlimited wants to send two teams of, of two and himself so they can integrate open dialogue into their dialogical network and will include other supportive approaches like hearing voices groups, alternatives to suicide, peer respite, and international peer support all around their wellness and holistic centers. Have you set up the training schedule for next year? And We're going to do that. I'm actually going to put it online. Um, it's going to start in January or February of next year. I'm going to, I'm meeting with uh, Yako Sekula, who's going to be part of it in April. So when I get back in April, we're going to put it online. And the t next two-year training program will be, um, should be up by the end of the April. And I welcome anyone to take it. Um, okay. Oh, so the five, yeah, the five-day training. Yeah, so I see somebody's. Yeah. Yeah, the five-day training, you can sign up on the website. Um, do you want me to type in the website? I'll send out, when I send okay. out an email, you could, but I, when I send out the email, I'll send out an email for a link to the recording of this meeting, and I'll include the link to your website so that people can, um, you know, make sure people have that. Okay. So yeah, I know we're about at the end of our time, and I see um, a few people are trying to type a few more things in. Um, and 
you know, I really appreciate Mary you showing up. And one thing that always strikes me as interacting with you is just the heartfelt nature of what you share. Like even when you're reviewing things I'm totally familiar with, you'll have a twist of phrase that will just open up a new layer of meaning. I just really, you. you know, I really Thank appreciate you. your presence. I mean, I have to tell you also, you know, I feel like this has not only transformed my personal life, it's also transformed my, I mean, not just my professional life, it's also transformed my personal life and my relationship with my family. And I mean, I just so believe in this. And I just, you know, uh, want to bring it to everybody, not just, you know, not just, as I said, in terms of your work, but also just it changes your whole life. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks very much. I see a lot of people are typing in their thanks. Um, and it's just really great. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care. All right. Thank you for giving bye me bye. this opportunity.